We need to change the way we move about. And like it or not, we're going through a step change. In a step change, changing everything simultaneously actually reduces risks and barriers. We need to make a different kind of car in a different kind of manufacturing facility and supplied to customers under a different kind of contract. There's no product on the planet that I think is as remotely as good value for money as a modern motor car with all its complexity and refinement. But unfortunately, it's no longer fit for purpose. I'm not the only one who believes that the industry is no longer sustainable. And I mean financially and socially as well as environmentally. There are two distinct flavours of step change. Those driven internally, if you like, by technology, such as jet engines and the internet, which are potentially within our control. And then there are step changes driven by the external environment. These are outside our control. And our dominant constraints now, such as climate change and peak resource issues, were simply not on the radar in the last century. The external environment drives evolution and progress in everything. When conditions are stable, incremental optimization is, is the prudent way to progress. But a step change in external conditions forces a step change in animal species, in technology, and in business models. Changing everything in such circumstances makes sense, because it's easier to design a system to suit new conditions than it is to tweak a system that was designed to do something fundamentally different. The new system always emerges from surprising quarters, not a modification of the old. Dinosaurs were succeeded by mammals, not by better dinosaurs. The key point is that a successful strategy during a period of optimization becomes a catastrophic weakness when faced with a change in external conditions. We are here, top left, but uh, we are continuing to behave as if we are down in the bottom right. A modern car has a linear drivetrain. The engine is sized for peak power when accelerating, which is about five times the maximum constant power and it's used for less than 20% of the time. So for 80% of the time, the engine and the gearbox are 80% redundant, and all energy is released as heat. In our network electric powertrain, there are motors in all four wheels that are also the brakes, recovering over 50% of the energy from braking. This is stored to provide 80% of the power for acceleration, so the fuel cell can be sized for the, only for the remaining 20%. This downsizing of components and mass decompounding are the real benefits of regen braking. This is the first prototype that we've built for type approval. It's not a direct comparison with a new hydrogen Toyota Mirai, as it is only a two-seater for local use. But it accelerates to 100 kilometers an hour in the same time, just under 10 seconds. The Mirai has a fuel cell over 13 times as powerful to do this and uses over three times as much hydrogen per kilometer. To create a market for infrastructure, <coughs> for intercity cars, hundreds of filling stations are required, a classic chicken and egg. But if you initially come to market with a car for local use, and a lot of people get a car just for local use, the critical scale of infrastructure to unlock a commercial market comes down to just one, a small market I grant you, but a commercial one. When disruptive technologies come to market, they always enter in a niche where the weaknesses are less of an issue and always lead to a change in both market segmentation and business model. The local car is a niche and a new segment, and as for business model, we're the only car company who hope never to sell a car. Our proposition is to sell a performance contract with a fixed price element and a mileage rate, like a mobile phone, covering all costs, critically including fuel. This completely changes our financial drivers from obsolescence and high running costs to longevity and low running costs, aligning our interests with those of our customers. And this generates more revenue per car. Um, uh, the second-hand market's larger than the first. Uh, it enhances. It's larger than the first-hand market. It's out of reach if you sell cars. It enhances our resilience in an economic downturn. People stop buying cars, but they don't stop driving them. And we're selling mileage rather than cars. This is a shift we need to make. If you sell cars, you need you make more money by selling more cars. It also transforms the economics of bringing new low-carbon vehicle technologies to market. If you sell cars, you need to match the supply chain costs of conventional cars, which are staggeringly low. But if you make a more efficient car and internalize the lifetime operating costs, you can compete at the same price to the customer, even if the cost price is higher. 
Cars are currently tested in the Arctic and Death Valley, but whoever drives from the Arctic to Death Valley? As with houses, we should build different cars for different regions, environments and cultures. The weird scale economies of pressed steel bodies dictate a minimum efficient scale of about 300,000 per annum. But for advanced composites, it's only about 5,000. And there's no economic advantage from putting more sets of tooling in the same place. Each new plant can make a different car for different niches. This model is both profitable at small scale and scalable to high volume. And when we bring our cars to market, we will also open source the technology. We want these standards to become ubiquitous. By giving away the recipe for making money from making cars, we expect entrepreneurs to pop up making variants globally. But we can also establish direct joint ventures abroad with majority local ownership. We firmly believe that a car designed in, for instance, Saudi Arabia, by Saudi Arabians, will be a better car for Saudi Arabia than one designed here in Western Europe. In 2011, I was at a trade conference in which the consensus was that the penetration of the market by 2020 of alternative fueled vehicles will be less than 5% in nine years. This really makes me despair. And here is an example of what can be achieved in nine years. Let's not be witheringly modest in our ambitions. Thank you for your kind attention.